Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on your time zone. Thank you so much for joining us today as we celebrate the launch of our new volume with Cambridge University Press, CITES as a Tool for Sustainable Development. We are looking forward to some enriching and inspiring expert discussions about wildlife trade law and policy and global sustainable development. My name is Michelle Agnostu, a PhD candidate in international wildlife trade from the University of Waterloo in Canada, and I will be your moderator for today's event. And it is my sincerest pleasure to introduce you to your chairs, Professor Marie-Claire cordonnier Seger and Dr. David Andrew Wardell, two people who I've had the privilege of working very closely alongside over the last few years and who I have learned a lot from. Professor Marie-Claire cordonnier Seger is the Visiting Chair of Sustainable Development Law and Policy in the University of Cambridge and full professor of law in the University of Victoria in Canada. She is a distinguished professor, scholar, and expert jurist in law and governance on sustainable development and the author of over 25 books and 160 papers in five languages. She is a senior director of the Center for International Sustainable Development Law, or CISDL, where she chairs the Biodiversity Law and Governance Initiative and edits a series on treaties implementation for sustainable development for Cambridge University Press. Dr. David Andrew Wardell is a former research director of the Center for International Forestry Research, or C4, Forest and Governance Program. He is currently a principal scientist for the C4 value chains, finance, and investment team based in Denmark. He has more than 40 years of experience working on natural resource governance, capacity development, and finance issues in more than 20 Southeast Asian and Sub-Saharan African countries. He has published four books, 90 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters, and over 70 technical reports. As a quick administrative note, if you have any questions or if you would like to seek clarifications for any of our honored invited speakers throughout the event, you may write them in the Q&A at any point, and our team of moderators will be keeping track of this and will communicate them to our chairs during the dialogue session. I would also like to introduce my colleague, Ms. Lydia Young, who is the Biodiversity Law and Governance Initiative Coordinator with the Center for International Sustainable Development Law and a JD candidate at the University of Victoria. Lydia has supported me with coordinating this exciting event, and I will hand the floor over to her now. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Michelle. It is my pleasure to be here with all of you today. And I would also like to now introduce Professor Jorge Cabrera, who will be supporting Professor Cordonia Seger and Dr. Wardell as chair. Professor Cabrera is a professor of environmental law in the environment, agriculture and biodiversity law at the University of Costa Rica. He is also an international consultant in the areas of intellectual property and biodiversity, biotechnology and biosafety, access to genetic resources and benefit sharing. Finally, Professor Cabrera is also lead counsel for the Center of International Sustainable Development Laws, Biodiversity and Bio, uh, Biosafety Program. Uh, thank you. I will hand it over to you, Professor. Thank you very much to both Advocate Young and also Michelle um, Agnostu. It has been a privilege and a project to see the events that have led to this um, very exciting celebratory event um, unfold over the years. I'd like to especially thank and recognize all of our colleagues who are here with us not just the co-editors of the volume that we're celebrating today, but also those who helped ab initio, such as um, uh, John Scanlon, who's here with us, uh, Dr. Marcos Regis da Silva, who's here with us, and many, many others. Um, it is truly an honor and a pleasure to have brought this uh, long-standing project to fruition and to be able to chair this event today that celebrates and launches uh, the new authoritative book in this area, um, uh, CITES, as a tool for sustainable development. I would like to um, especially just remind everyone that we have a very intense and fascinating agenda in which we will be profiling not just, of course, the convention itself, and we're very, very deeply pleased to have a keynote speaker here today um, who, will, who will assist us with that, um, but also some of the world's leading experts in the law and policy and science of this area. 
So we will start with an opening keynote, of course, from the Secretary General of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna. And then we will immediately move to three experts roundtables. The first one will look at endangered species, sustainable development and the law. The second will consider global implementation of CITES by key species and commodity because one of the innovations of this book was looking at the um, legislation that guides and regulates um, uh, species from the time that they are um, uh, in, uh, in some way impacted in, in, in their community of origin all the way to the markets that they reach when um, the trade has been taking place. And then third, of course, we will look at national implementation of CITES and what are some of the lessons from the um, important scientific and legal studies that are presented in the book before we come together for a dialogue among all of the experts who are presenting um, together with you who have joined us online today and also um, uh, underlining some of the main messages that the many uh, registrants who are not on this time zone but will be watching the recording later may also find interesting. That dialogue session will take us through to our closing where we have um, an, an additional keynote speech that we will be hearing from the Chief Executive Officer for the Center for International Forestry Research and World Agroforestry, and also um, uh, the unenviable task of my co-chair, um, uh, Dr. D. Andrew Bordell, um, who is also co-editor of the volume that is being celebrated and launched today. Um, and he will be the one who has to give concluding key messages based on what I'm sure will be a rich and intense and fascinating discussion. So without further ado, I would like to turn the floor briefly to my co-chairs, um, starting with Professor Jorge Cabrera, and, uh, and, then, and then come back to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, Jorge? Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie Claire, uh, for uh, this opportunity to take part of this exciting uh, a webinar, launching a, a, a very a very, I think, well-needed uh, book on, on CITES as a, as a tool for sustainable development. I just uh, perhaps wanted to highlight a few issues coming from my country, Costa Rica. I had the opportunity to participate as co-author of several of the chapters of the book. But just let me know that uh, recently, in the last year, uh, there are two very important judicial decisions related to the CITES implementation in our country. So that this is a proof that CITES is very relevant for our countries, in, in, the, in my case, Costa Rica. Um, one of the decisions was related to the a, a decree creating a new author, administrative authority in charge of marine resources under CITES. This decree was declared invalid because of the lack of public participation. Afterwards, another decree was issued with the, the corresponding, of course, requirements. But this highlight the, highlights the importance of CITES and the importance of public participation in the context of the CITES implementation, which is one of the chapters I co-author. And the second, which is a more recent uh, judicial decision by the highest court in Costa Rica dealing with uh, administrative matters actually used CITES as an argument to improve the protection for the hammerhead shark. So this is quite important because we have these two, we have an old one, but I'm not, I don't have the time to talk about that. But uh, I think again, my reflection is that CITES is not only uh, it's not only a treaty without any practical implementation in Costa Rica, but in practice, there are several very, very well known and very important judicial case implementing CITES and using CITES as an argument to improve environmental protection of marine species in Costa Rica. So um, having said that, um, I would like to uh, call Andrew, if you would like to bring the, our opening session, welcome to a close with your uh, remarks. And thank you very much. And again, it's a pleasure and an honor to be part of this uh, launch of the book. Thank you very much, Jorge and Marie Claire for the introductions. I will uh, try and be brief because it's me that's keeping us from 
listening to Yvonne Higuero and her opening keynote speech. All I would like to say is that it's been a privilege and a pleasure to work with Marie Claire uh, as a co-editor on this book over many years. And I'm glad and very happy, as I'm sure Marie Claire is, that we have finally got the book published, which is celebrating with you today. Um, it's been an enormous team effort. There were 44 contributing authors to the book. Um, and Jorge has given me the opportunity to highlight, I think, one of the distinctions of the book. And that is that I think the book has moved away from, in many CITES publications, a traditional focus on iconic terrestrial vertebrates. And uh, Jorge mentioned the hammerhead shark. This is just one of many examples of the species outside of that classic range of iconic uh, terrestrial vertebrates that the book also includes. So I will stop here, welcome everyone. Last time I looked, I think we had 139 people online. If I'm not mistaken, Michelle, there were over 700 who registered, but I can see already the numbers are rising. So a big welcome to all the panelists and all of those who are joining us online and many thanks for your participation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wardell, Andrew, and thank you so much, Professor Cabrera Jorge. Um, I'm now honored to introduce our opening keynote speaker for today, Ms. Yvonne Higuero, who is an inspiration to us all and is well on her way to becoming a dear friend as well. So I am deeply, deeply grateful to her for accepting our invitation to speak. She is, of course, the Secretary General of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, um, and also an environmental economist with a career spanning over 26 years in international organizations in the area of sustainable development, with global, regional, and national levels of experience and commendations from all of those she has worked with. Um, and it includes especially engaging with stakeholders across the public and private sectors. She is what we would have to also recognize a client. So um, you will have to be extra special, um, uh, polite and courteous to her lawyers because the non-lawyers who are among us, who, um, who we need to listen to and who need to tell us um, what are the key issues that are being faced and give us our brief um, are, are, are specially valued. Um, Yvonne, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor, for that lovely introduction. It is really a great honor and pleasure to have been invited not only to be here today, but also to write the preface of CITES as a tool for sustainable development and be here for this to deliver the opening keynote uh, address for this launch, and especially amongst such distinguished guests. So many thanks to the Center for International Sustainable Development Law, the University of Waterloo, the University of Victoria, the University of Cambridge, the Center for International Forestry Research, and World Agroforestry and other partners for the invitation and organization of this book launch. Congratulations for this and for the timely publication of this book, as right now the international community is taking stock of progress on achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Many of you may not be aware that CITES is now half a century old since the 3rd of March this year. Still a little younger than me, but it's been around for a while too. We are continuing our celebrations throughout the year to highlight its work to regulate the international trade in endangered species of wild plants and animals. The convention is one of the earliest among multilateral environmental agreements. It now regulates international trade in over 40,000 species of plants and animals. It has almost universal membership with 184 parties, including the European Union. The convention aim is to ensure the legality, traceability, and sustainability of this international trade in wildlife and operates through a system of permits and certificates issued by national management authorities in each member country. Now, what may come as a surprise to you and those online who may not know CITES very well is that CITES allows commercial international trade in over 97% of the species that are included in its appendices, provided that all relevant rules are respected. More than a million CITES permits are issued every year and no trade should be authorized if it may threaten the viability of the species. This is sustainability. This is what will allow us to continue to trade in these natural products that underpin human well-being. Over the past 50 years, the parties have continued building the capacity of their scientific and management authorities that represent CITES in each country 
to be able to take what I call the foundational documents, the foundational tools of the convention, these scientific and legal studies that are needed to allow CITES permits and certificates to be issued. A non-detriment finding is a sustainability assessment required by CITES that assures that the specific trade is not causing damage to the species in the wild. And for the lawyers out there, trade in CITES specimen requires a legal acquisition finding. Anyone seeking to trade in a CITES listed species must show documentation for the chain of custody of the specimen from its origin to export. Now you may ask yourselves, why do CITES parties regulate wildlife trade and what is the importance of this trade for the world? Today, 8 billion people on our planet are consuming millions of products in their daily lives that are derived from wild animals and plants, often without even being aware of our relation and interdependency with nature and its web of life. The overall global value of wildlife trade has been estimated at over 200 billion US dollars per year. These traded species, some of which are regulated by CITES, include fish and other marine species, as well as many plant species. I always like to highlight that of all the species regulated by CITES, which includes high value timber and commercial marine species, the vast majority of them are plants. A growing, a growing human population is predicted to need more and more of the resources that nature provides. For example, if current trends continue, we are expected to need 60% more food by 2050 than is currently being produced. However, for marine species, FAO reports that 35% of fish stocks are overfished already. Almost one third of all shark and ray species are believed to be threatened with extinction. It is also recognized that 60% of known turtle and tortoise species are either threatened with extinction or have already gone extinct and that more than 40% of amphibian species are threatened with extinction. Trees that are highly valuable for their wood are also under threat of extinction due to overexploitation and wildlife trafficking. Making matters worse, loss of habitat, climate change, pollution, and disease are also impacting plants and animals in the wild. So the pressure's on us, but then again, the pressure is on all of us. Biodiversity loss, climate change and pollution are the three planetary issues that we must face down together if we are to leave a healthy planet for generations to come. Now, last year, there were a series of intergovernmental meetings to determine the path that we should take. We call these meetings COPs as they gather the conference of the parties to our conventions as the highest decision-making bodies. Allow me a few seconds to highlight some of the results of the CITES COP19 meeting in Panama in November last year and the CBD COP15 meeting in Montreal in December last year. Firstly, CITES parties took a record-breaking 365 decisions. In the Secretariat, we joke about one decision per day of the year and also added or changed the status of over 500 species to the CITES appendices. As a result of the proposals presented by the parties, four bird species, 100 shark and ray species, 50 turtle and tortoise species, 160 species of amphibians, and 150 tree species have been added to Appendix 2 and will need CITES permits to trade. We often say that the listing is, is the easy part. The difficult work is now coming to regulate the trade in these species by assisting parties to prepare their non-detriment findings and legal acquisition findings. And also at COP19, as an example of the importance of the wildlife trade, the pilot edition of the World Wildlife Trade Report was launched. We worked with the World Trade Organization and others to provide as comprehensive an overview of wildlife trade as possible. The report considers the roots, scale, and patterns of international trade in CITES listed species, together with the values, conservation impacts, and socioeconomic benefits of such trade, as well as the linkages between legal and illegal trade. There is evidence on how legal trade benefits local and national economies and should motivate greater investment in conservation, especially by industry, to stop overexploitation, avoid land conversion, and enhance resilience. After CITES COP19 in December, there was a great rejoicing at CBD COP15 with the adoption of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. This historic framework sets out an ambitious pathway to reach the global vision 
of a world living in harmony with nature by 2050. The framework has several targets related to societies. I mentioned here the most relevant target, which is target five, to ensure that the use, harvesting, and trade of wild species is sustainable, safe, and legal, preventing overexploitation, minimizing impacts on non-target species and ecosystems, and reducing the risk of pathogen spillover, applying the ecosystem approach. And listen to this, while respecting and protecting customary sustainable use by indigenous peoples and local communities. This is very important. And now more than ever, we will need to increase our partnerships and collaboration with others on achieving these and the sustainable development goals. We cannot work in isolation, competing for scarce resources. To illustrate further the importance of the Convention for Sustainable Development, allow me to focus on the increasing number of commercially valuable marine and timber species that are being added to the CITES appendices. Forests, forest species and ecosystem services sustain the livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people globally, and particularly of indigenous people and local communities with historic ties to forested and forest adjacent areas. Globally, up to 350 million people live within or adjacent to forested areas, relying on forests and their species to cover their basic needs from food to shelter, fuel and medicines. Forest and forest wildlife also provide for the incomes and well being of countless people that do not necessarily live near them. Worldwide, some 80 million jobs, both in the formal and informal sectors, are directly sustained by forest resources. CITES parties are contributing to global forest relevant mandates and forest policies and initiatives through its work on more than 700 species of trees that are listed in CITES. For example, our decade-long collaboration with the ITTO through the CITES Tree Species Program has strengthened global scientific and legal capacities. While the CITES and FAO UN Red Project in the Lower Mekong region has delivered valuable regional outputs, including legal and sustainability findings for timber and timber identification resources. CITES parties have now set a new three-year challenge for tree species. We are designing projects on timber identification, plantation and forest management guidelines for CITES tree species, capacity building for enforcement officers, rosewood sustainability findings, musical instrument traceability, and taxonomic lists for CITES tree species. And now moving on to marine species. Healthy oceans are vital for food security, with fish providing 20% of animal protein needs on average for 3.3 billion people, and important for livelihoods with roughly 39 million people depending on capture fisheries for their livelihoods. Over the last 50 years, CITES has taken on a greater and greater role in the regulation of international trade in commercially exploited species of sharks and rays, including those iconic species like the manta ray and the devil ray. When it comes to conservation of marine species, CITES is a unique and dynamic tool with a dedicated focus on capacity building and helping countries to implement the convention to meet their needs. For example, our joint work with UNCTAD and OECS in the Caribbean to help communities ensure that trade in one vital local marine species, the Queen Conch, is CITES compliant. Through this collaboration, the CITES Secretariat could support Grenada by assisting them to develop a roadmap towards having adequate CITES legislation. And when it comes to the complex interrelationship between CITES listed species in the ecosystem and threats posed by ever exploitation and wildlife trafficking, we are not afraid to dive in to support national authorities. You may have seen the heads of my legal and enforcement units on boats and handling nets in the Gulf of California, California verifying how Mexican authorities are combating trafficking in Totoaba swim bladders, which threatens the existence of Akita, these small porpoises where only a few are thought to remain in the wild. Our partners range from Interpol to UNESCO, and not only do we look at the regulations, but provide alternative solutions to maintain livelihoods, such as training on how to use less harmful nets for sustainable fishing. And finally, related to this, it is important to note that wildlife crime impacts sustainable development. It destroys habitats and drives many species to extinction. It also undermines the rule of law, development, food security, 
human health and livelihoods. This ultimately hinders progress towards the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And to combat this, CITES parties have adopted a powerful suite of decisions and resolutions on enforcement matters and support the work of the International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crime, or IQIC, which includes the CITES Secretariat, Interpol, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the World Bank, and the World Customs Organization. We provide member states with the tools, services, technical support, and capacity building they need to combat wildlife crime. Ladies and gentlemen, to be firmly on the path to sustainable development, we must address our environmental crises and further resilience. This requires having evidence-based regulations in place that we must enforce. As Secretary General of CITES, I know that parties are taking the tough decisions to address the crisis that we face, but without effective implementation, we will fail. We need to work with others to have the breadth of impact necessary to respond to the scale of the challenges. Human progress was built on trade, but it is not enough to look just to the past. We must work together on a new model for the future, one that has sustainability at its heart and leaves our communities, our nations, and our world stronger and more resilient as a result. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary General Iguero, for joining us today to emphasize the crucial importance of CITES for sustainable development and also for kindly providing a truly lovely preface, which encourages these and other future scholarship um, serious commitments to legal and governance scholarship in this field. I um, personally, and we are all deeply grateful for your substantive, thoughtful, and encouraging uh, message, um, including as to the crucial role of this accord and of all the diverse and myriad species under the collective wings of this community. Your insights on sustainable wild species trade are incredibly valuable and your keynote has laid the foundations beautifully for our expert roundtable discussions, which we will transition to now. Thank you so Thank much, you. Yvonne. Thank you for <laughs> and to all my colleagues on the panels. Thank you. Well, I hope that your copy will soon be in your hands if it isn't already. Looking forward to it. <laughs> it's, um, it's substantial. <laughs> I can see, I can see. Absolutely. Christmas reading, thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And uh, we will uh, now immediately move to our first roundtable discussion on endangered species, sustainable development, and the law. And the questions that we are going to focus on in this discussion are considering three dimensions of sustainable development, environmental, social, and economic, what are the mechanisms under CITES that contribute to sustainable development? What progress has been made in international wild species, trade, law, and policy that advances efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals? How to foster synergies between CITES and the legal institutional frameworks in protected areas to achieve sustainable development? We could not be joined by three better informed and um, better um, engaged um, leading experts in this field to help us to address these focus questions. So I'm going to turn now to Michelle as our moderator to introduce our three speakers. Thank you, Marie Claire. I'm excited to begin our first panel discussion of the day, the theme being endangered species, sustainable development and the law. And it is my honor to introduce our three invited speakers and volume authors for this session. Mr. John E. Scanlon, Dr. Marcos Regis da Silva and Professor Adesola Olatunde Edipoju. Mr. John Scanlon is Chief Executive Officer of the Elephant Protection Initiative Foundation, Chair of the UK Challenge Fund, Trustee of the Royal Botanic Gardens, Q, and Chair of the Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime. He was African Park's first Special Envoy from 2018 to 2020 and served as the fifth Secretary General of CITES from 2010 to 2018. In 2019, he was made an Officer of the Order of Australia for Distinguished Service to Conservation. Dr. Marcos Regis da Silva is a special advisor to Silver Lining, where he is assisting the organization to ensure that society has sufficient options to address near-term climate risk. He held the post of executive director of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. 
Marcos was also a coordinator with the Amazon Cooperative Cooperation Treaty Organization, where he implemented a large-scale project on trade and wildlife, and previously held the post of Chief Knowledge Management and Outreach Services with CITES. And Professor Adeshola Olatunde Adepoju is a professor of Agricultural Economics and Environmental Resource Management. He was the Director General and Chief Executive Officer of the Forestry Research Institute of Nigeria and Senior Advisor on Nature-Based Solutions to the Honorable Minister of Environment between 2015 and 2023. He is currently the Chair of the UNESCO International Coordinating Council of the Man and the Biosphere Program. John, Marcos, and Adeshola, welcome. And Marie Claire and Andrew will be serving as chairs of this discussion. I'm just going to ask if John, your microphone is working. Yep, my microphone's working, I think. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to just switch my own personal view to gallery and turn straight to you. And uh, we are very, very happy to hear your words. As you know, you have um, six minutes or eight minutes max, but you have um, uh, all incentive to uh, be more brief if you wish so that there can be more questions asked to you. Great. Well, thanks for the invitation. Lovely to see so many uh, colleagues online and uh, congratulations on getting this publication out. Uh, it was a long time in the making, but persistence pays and it's, it's a very valuable contribution to this discussion. I think the starting point, I mean, when we talk about CITES and sustainable development, the starting point is what does the convention text actually say? An interesting thing, you know, this text goes back 50 years and you don't find the word sustainability, sustainable use or sustainable development reflected in the text at all. Because these are terms and these are concepts that were developed sometime after the convention. So what does the convention do? What, what's at the heart of the convention? Why do parties, you know, states create this convention in the first place? And it, it, it's found in the, in the text of the convention. They wanted to protect species or certain species of wild animals and plants from over-exploitation through international trade. That, that's at the heart of it. And given the time, I'm just gonna focus on the um, commercial trade aspect of CITES at the moment, which is, as Yvonne said, the 97% of species that can be commercially traded. So what do you have to do if you are going to commercially trade? Well, you have to do the legal acquisition finding and the non-detriment finding. And the legal acquisition finding is that it was the species were not taken in contravention of national laws. The non-detriment finding is that the trade will not have a detrimental impact on the survival of the species. So when you look at what the convention is looking at, it is looking at the impact and the assessment is on the impact of the, spe on the, of the trade of that species. It's not looking at the impact from a social perspective or from an economic perspective. It's purely looking at this trade from the perspective of environment. So it's a convention that addresses the environmental dimension of sustainable development in the context of its own terms. Now, the same goes to how you get certain species under trade regulation. And that is that they are either threatened with extinction or they could become threatened with extinction if you don't strictly regulate their trade. And the criteria, the biological and trade criteria adopted by parties follow that path. So again, the listing of a species is based on environmental criteria. Again, the environmental dimension of sustainable development. So that's the, the starting point of the convention. Now, if you think about how many species does it regulate trade in? 40,000 species, 30,000 of them are orchids. And that's out of 8 million species. So the convention's regulating 0.5% of the world's species. So that's our starting point. Now, what have the parties done? You know, it's a, it's a dated convention in some senses, but what have they done? The parties have recognized over the past 50 years, but most particularly the last 20 years, that there is a context within which the convention needs to be viewed. We've had the sustainable development concept from the Brooklyn Commission report to Rio 1992, reinforced in 20. 12 in Rio again. So we have a sustainable development context. We have a sustainable use context. So what have the parties done? Nobody's gone back to amend the text of the convention. Apart from a couple of technical amendments, the CITES convention text is the same today as it was 50 years ago. 
So without changing the content of the convention, what have the parties sought to do? What they've sought to do is nestle the convention within contemporary thinking. So how have they done that? They've done that through a series of resolutions and decisions. Now, resolutions and decisions are non-binding. There's an expectation with resolutions that they will be adhered to, but they're not binding. They're not part of the legally binding obligations on the convention, which is found in the convention text itself. So what have they done? They've done a number of things, but what they've focused on is implementation. They haven't changed the basis or the criteria upon which you list a species. They haven't changed the criteria or basis upon which you determine whether you're going to authorize a trade. Rather, they're saying, accepting all of that is there, we're going to focus on implementation and how, when we implement the convention, we're having regard to the sustainable development, the sustainable use agenda. And in particular, what they're focused on is the role of local communities and indigenous peoples, how you can ensure they can benefit from this trade, how you can ameliorate the um, impact of this trade, in particular when it's an Appendix 1 listed species where commercial trade is prohibited. So how do you deal with that in the context of implementation? Then it also looks at how do you engage Indigenous peoples, local communities and others in the decision making process? How do you consult with them? How do you bring them on board through this process? But again, this is all done by resolution. This is advice to parties about how you ought to implement the convention and engage others in the implementation of the convention. Then you get to the point of, well, where do CITES contribute to sustainable development, a concept that was developed sometime after the adoption of the convention? Again, the convention text remains intact and the criteria remain intact. But what they've said is what we will do is look at how the implementation of the convention can contribute to multiple goals and targets, in particular, the IACHI targets that have now gone, the global biodiversity framework targets and the sustainable development goals. How can CITES contribute to that? And what it's saying is that if you implement this convention effectively, then you will be able to contribute to multiple goals and targets. Because if it's implemented effectively, there are benefits that can flow to local communities and Indigenous peoples. There are benefits that can flow in many ways from an economic and a social perspective. But the convention starting point and ending point in terms of the convention text is its focus on the environmental dimension of sustainable development. And what the parties have tried to do is embed that in the context of the concept of sustainable development and demonstrate how well implementing the convention has social benefits and also has economic benefits while recognizing there are also detrimental impacts, in particular with Appendix 1 listing. And we also have all the impacts of wildlife trafficking. Again, recognizing that 6,000 species listed under CITES are found in uh, illegal trade. But according to the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, there are millions of other species that are also found in illegal trade. So there are, it, it's a 1970s convention. It was drafted in a particular way. The language has a particular flavor, but at its heart today, 50 years later, it is still about protecting certain species of wild animals and plants from over-exploitation through international trade. And there's a regulatory framework that's been put in place to do that, legal acquisition, non-detriment finding, and all of that, if it's done properly, can result in multiple other benefits. You can track under the sustainable development goals and others. But there are other gaps in the Absolutely. convention. Absolutely. We, we might need to stop there. There are other gaps, and we'll come to that through questions. I don't know how long I was talking. I wasn't timing myself. <laughs> OK, no worries. You, you've just hit your eight-minute final, final limit. And um, in uh, the book itself, John Scanlon, Marcos, um, and Marcy have um, written the fundamental chapter on origins, evolution, and contribution of CITES to achieving sustainable development. And I would thoroughly commend it to you. I would also like to, of course, um, highlight that John's intervention is probably the best teaser that you can get for reading that chapter first. I'm going to turn directly to Marcos in order to hear a few words from him as well, again, with the strict time limit to allow us time for questions and discussion. Thank you, Marie Claire, and many thanks for the invitation to participate in the launch, uh, Dr. Andrew Wardo as well. And maybe this is an opportunity to greet my colleagues, uh, Ivani Gerald, Secretary General, and also the former Secretary General and my friend, John Scallon. We worked many years together in, in CITES. I consider this work to be a landmark study. 
it'll probably become a reference point for future studies. But it's perhaps right now, it's, it's a moment to reflect on why CITES, maybe with along with the Montreal Protocol, is viewed as a uniquely effective convention. Why is that? And I, I think the gathering of the, this community to discuss the impact of CITES on sustainable use of wildlife and its contributions more generally to sustainable development is reflective of its success. And it's also perhaps an opportune moment to ask why the success of CITES in counterpart to its sister conventions. We only have to think of the dismal results of the IHE targets under the UN Strategic Plan for Biodiversity, not one target reached. I would argue that the success of CITES lies in the fact that it is above all a trade regulatory mechanism. That is, CITES is best viewed as a commerce instrument as opposed to an environmental convention. And this was my work when I was in CITES under John. And uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, the commerce ministries in many countries had a lot of money to automate trade procedures. And CITES was never considered part of that regulatory mechanism, but it is a trade regulatory mechanism. It is the Convention on International Trade. And the mechanisms in this trade regulatory instrument, again, non-detriment findings, review of significant trade, the quota system, and so on, ensures that that trade in wildlife remains legal, sustainable, and traceable. It is a trade convention ensuring sustainability. It is not an environmental convention that ensures that the trade is sustainable. The success is supported by research, which claims that trade treaties are most effective and that other treaties have largely failed to reach its objectives. I'm going to quote a very brief paragraph because it's worth reflecting on this. According to a systematic field-wide evidence synthesis of 224 primary studies and meta-analysis of the higher quality 82 studies, international treaties have mostly failed to produce their intended effects. The only exceptions are treaties governing international trade and finance, which consistently produced intended effects. And we will consistently find praise for CITES as being a uniquely effective convention. Now, couple this view of CITES as a trade convention with its innovative and cutting edge access in use of new information commerce technologies to conduct such trade. And because CITES is immersed in the world of trade regulation, of electronic commerce, it has become very different from its sister conventions. For example, it's, it is technologically possible right now for the CITES trade database to become an up-to-the-minute resource to understand current levels of trade. It, it, it makes the annual reports completely useless because you could have a permit registered on the trade database immediately on issuance. So if your minister asked what is the current levels of trade in my country today, you could give them a up to the minute report. Uh, CITES annual reports, again, are all news, especially since this can be done immediately on issuance. Moreover, all CITES regulatory, trade regulatory processes are compliant and harmonized with those of the World Customs Organization in a little known but very important United Nations body called the Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business, or UNCFACT. And these are the two most important uh, global organizations setting standards on international trade. For instance, in most countries now, CITES electronic permits are compliant with systems called single window environments, which integrates all trade regulatory requirements for trade to occur legally and to be traceable and if for it to be sustainable. So with these words, thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this event. And I am very pleased to see everyone. Thank you, Marie-Claire. 
perfectly timed. Thank you so much, Marcos. And uh, I, I swear you and John together just cover things absolutely brilliantly. Speaking of um, uh, bringing forward the issues absolutely brilliantly, it's, it's truly an honor to pass the floor to Professor Adeshola Olatunde Adepoju. Uh, would you like to unmute and- Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, and I must comment that everyone who, at the one word or other, contributed to, to the book that you display earlier on. And I think this is going to have uh, a big effect on us. And I also want to thank all the earlier speakers uh, for their contribution. Uh, and I must also commend the Secretary General of uh, CITES and all the wonderful job uh, CITES is doing. I was uh, with them in the, the last uh, convention we had, and I, I, I attest to the, the enormous work CITES is doing. Yes, the CITES has the, the mechanism that uh, have been shared with us, and that many countries has uh, adopted as a tool uh, for, for protecting this ecosystem. Uh, but beyond the implementation of them, and um, uh, I still want to plead with scientists that will still have a lot of work to do, uh, because even when you do the non detriment finding of your country, and uh, you are certain uh, some challenges or depletion in some of your uh, resources, uh, particularly in some of the African countries, where, where we have a lot of challenges, particularly in the enforcement of our laws to prevent so many things uh, in happening. So we still believe that CITES has a lot of work to do with us to help us assert more prayer on the receiving countries of most of these uh, uh, illegal trade issues that is affecting the sustainability of our environment. Uh, the same thing go for the review of significant trade as well as the establishment of the export quotas uh, that we were supposed to do. Uh, for instance, in, in Nigeria, a national strategy plan on national strategy to combat wildlife and forest crime in Nigeria between 2022 and 2026 was developed and launched for the implementation last year. Uh, we must thank CITES for their role in that to mobilize all the international agencies to work with the national stakeholders in the country to put that together, where a five-year plan strategic document is made to focus on facilitating the implementation of policies aim at protecting, restoring, and promoting sustainable of this biodiversity uh, 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 that we have. The document is a significant tool in Nigeria, again, thanks to CITES, who uh, assisted in uh, uh, achieving this in effort to combating wildlife and forest crime in a holistic evidence-based manner and in conformity with international best practices, as well as relevant treaties and convention to which Nigeria is a signatory, which include the Convention uh, of CITES and UNTOC. Implementing the stated objective in this document implies Nigeria will have the required institutional commitment, necessary organization structure, and capability to effectively address both transitional and domestic wildlife crime. How to foster synergy between CITES and the legal and institutional framework. Combating illegal trade and trafficking require a coordinated and collaborate, uh, collaborative response. The international legal framework as contained in CITES protect many endangered or threatened animal and plants, recommends to various governments to ban or restrict trade in such flora and fauna species and their products like Pterocarpus rhinoceros, which is the rose food in Africa, the crocodile skin, the uh, rhinos on the pangolins that have been moving across Africa, particularly to the Asia. Uh, this was why I was, uh, I was pleading with the Secretary General of uh, CITES that they should also help us on the other hand, uh, where these, uh, uh, most of these illegal issues are going. As such, to synergize the relationship between CITES and the legal and the framework will require enhancing institutional capabilities, especially the CITES scientific management and enforcement authority, 
strengthening of legal framework by reviewing and updating policy documents in line with contemporary and evolving global environmental challenges, reinforcing collaborative and maintaining effective local, national, and international network of communication, engaging the grassroots community in participatory management approach while providing alternative sustainable livelihood enterprise will also be helpful. As the chair of Mabai CC, I, I, I know this document will be useful to us in, in, in uh, working better with most of our basket sites, which are having challenges, particularly in the legal uh, framework area of their work. Uh, with that, I want to stop here so that I won't take too much of your time. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. That is deeply appreciated and your timing was absolutely perfect. I'm trying again to um, uh, to show the book with a little bit more more attention. Um, I, I, hope, I hope we're going to get a copy of it. Oh, absolutely. I think all authors are receiving their copies quite soon. Um, Cambridge Thank University you. Press has promised us that they will send it. Um, Thank you. But uh, deeply, deeply appreciated both for your expertise and your invention and also, of course, your um, incredibly important chapter. Rather than taking questions now, as there is more time to take questions um, uh, following this, this session, I will um, turn immediately to our second panel um, after thanking all three of the experts who have kindly um, uh, shared their insights today and laid the foundation for the entire event, really. And then what we would like to do is to also remind and invite everyone who is with us to please, if at all possible, if you have questions for the experts that you would like to already see addressed, type them into the Q&A and they can, if they have time, uh, type answers for you. We will also bring these back further when we, when we pause for questions and engagement with the audience. Thank you so, so much. And we will now turn, especially to our second panel, um, our second round table on global implementation of CITES by key species and commodity. And here our focus questions in particular are, what are some of the risks of failing to consider complexity, for example, consumer demand, livelihoods and market dynamics in CITES decision-making? How to create a proficient system of sustainable management for the use and trade of species which are highly sought after, for example, pangolins or hammerhead sharks, or frankincense. What would this look like and where does CITES fit in? What reforms will make the convention more effective in its efforts for sustainable trade and development? John highlighted in particular how international regimes can and do evolve over time through the decisions of the parties and the understandings in a community of practice. This of course is my area of legal scholarship. So I'm going to carefully hold myself back and instead turn to Michelle in order to uh, introduce our third panel, uh, three panelists. Thank you, Marie Claire, and thank you, John Marcos and Adeshola, for that important discussion. We will now turn to our honored invited experts for our second roundtable discussion of the day the global implementation of CITES by key species and commodity. And our incredible list of speakers for this discussion includes Professor Laura Elizondo Garcia, Dr. Daniel W.S. Challender, and Dr. Stephen Johnson, all of whom have an incredible wealth of knowledge. Professor Laura Elizondo Garcia is a professor, researcher, and consultant in environmental law at the University of Costa Rica. She has acted as an external consultant for NGOs focused on researching and promoting the sustainable use of marine resources, and she has worked in the agro-environmental area in the Costa Rica's Attorney General's Office. Her professional experience has been focused on academic research and consultancy work on a variety of environmental issues. Dr. Jan Challender is a research fellow at the University of Oxford and is affiliated with the Interdisciplinary Center for Conservation Science and the Oxford Martin School. He has completed extensive research on CITES and reforming international wildlife trade interventions. He previously worked with IUCN's Global Species Program to lead the organization's contribution to CITES. In 2012, reformed the IUCN Species Survival Commission Penguin Specialist Group and served as its chair between 2012 and 2021. And Mr. Stephen Johnson is a technical advisor on wild plant conservation and wild uh, value chain development for biodiversity and conservation and sustainable development. He has particular expertise on non-timber forest products and frankincense and myrrh production systems, where he works with private company initiatives, NGOs, research institutions, and multilaterals to create partnerships to drive systemic change. Additionally, he works to build socially, economically, and ecologically regenerative supply chains for wild plants and the communities that harvest them. 
Welcome, Laura, Dan, and Stephen. I'd also like to specially thank um, John Scanlon, who uh, has just posted a note on the chat that he, unfortunately he does have to run for the best reasons in the world, which are of course to do with uh, future generations. Um, so um, thank you, John, and uh, your insights are deeply, deeply appreciated both in the um, round table and also in the book. And I'd like to remind all three speakers that you have six minutes. Thank you. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let me set my uh, chronometer so I don't uh, <laughs> take up a lot of your time. Uh, well, thank you for inviting us, for uh, sharing this amazing book launch. And after all this work and all the authors that participated. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to focus on uh, the focus questions uh, because I think that can have, uh, as my presentation would have a better structure. So I think first uh, focusing especially on hammerhead charts, which was one of our chapters, I would like to start by uh, examining the complexity of consumer demand, livelihoods, and market dynamics uh, inside the decision making. Without a doubt, uh, one of the most serious risks would be uh, the ineffectiveness of the convention and, it, and its provisions, and therefore a significant impact on the species. And I share deeply what Professor Cabrera said. We need more uh, stakeholder participation, more public participation. Recent history has, have, uh, has taught us that uh, in environmental matters, participation of local communities, uh, indigenous peoples uh, are key to uh, achieve sustainability. So in these uh, matters and, or, or in this instance, um, to create a provision system of sustainable management also means involving the people in a more active way, and also taking other valuables, uh, variables into account. We are at a stage, uh, uh, at a point in history where we are losing biodiversity and we have to be more creative. We have to think outside the box. So I think that given the fact that CITES is a trade convention and it's based on commodities, we could try changing the nature of the commodification of the species. For, for instance, you have that, or you could have that with uh, hammerhead charts. Uh, in Costa Rica, a couple of years back, there was a study uh, performed where uh, the value of the shark, of the live shark, was more than the value of the shark uh, for, uh, you know, fished for uh, shark fin soup, for instance. So we had uh, um, results of $7 million for the local economy and $82,000, uh, the value of the shark just to be alive. In what sense? Well, if you, um, if you know the, the example I'm trying to set is Cocos Island, it's usually sought after for divers um, to swim because you can see sharks. Uh, there is there are a lot of hammerhead sharks there. So the value of the shark, it's it's more valuable to our people alive than fished or, or dead, if you if you will. And there's also another another example in Belize where the whale whale sharks generate at least thirty five thousand dollars in ecotourism ecotourism annually. So we we could try to change the perspective in the species about, yes, seeing it as a commodification, as a commodity, but not uh, that implies um, the species depletion. So it's a change in perspective that we could encourage. Also, always important education and capacity building, workshops, campaigns, every, every, everything we can have for the public to be informed. Uh, think about more demand management strategies so we can change a bit the perspective on it. Uh, some sort of eco-label could be important given the fact, for instance, in Hammerhead Shark, uh, that these are uh, products that it will are going to be um, probably are going to become shark fin soup. So they are very sought after because of, uh, due to their fins. So we can try to change this perspective. Uh, and eco-labeling eco -labeling would mean that seen as it is a high quality um, or um, luxurious product, we could have some sort of eco-labeling that can help to make it even more attractive, uh, not more attractive, more, um, 
how can I say this, this money that can be generated can help also to the implementation of CITES in the sense of uh, uh, campaigns and capability uh, and workshops and etc. And also, I think that it's very important, again, with the example of, of hammerhead shark, but it can be applied to different species, that parties should develop a strong instruments oriented to preserving nurseries and habitats and avoiding the capture of young specimens to guarantee completion of the, spe of the species a biological life cycle. So uh, this implies, obviously, more funding for a thorough implementation of the Convention for the Struggling Parties, uh, resolutions regarding these subjects and changes that as we saw after with uh, Professor Scanlon, uh, uh, Dr. Scanlon um, uh, participation, the resolutions of CITES and the, um, the decisions that the COP takes uh, are the, the, the instrument that help us move forward and have a convention that is modern uh, in spite of being 50 years old. And this keeps having of helping us to move forward into a more sustainable trade. And lastly, uh, there is always important, uh, there is always fundamental to have better traceability system, systems and uh, data collection that, that sometimes can be hard, especially with, reg with regards of, of uh, shark uh, fins. Uh, so I would like to be, uh, finish my presentation just um, highlighting that we need more stakeholder participation, taking people into consideration, local uh, local people, uh, indigenous peoples, uh, so that they can also put their input or give our give their input in things that decisions that um, regard their, their livelihoods. Also sharing the decision making process and information and always more education are key to, to move forward and to get, uh, to have a better um, uh, evolution or, or, of, or of CITES. And I think that uh, I'm on time. So I'm 30 seconds left. So I would like to finish here. Thank you so, so much, Professor Laura. Um, Elizondo um, Garcia. That was a truly insightful and helpful address. I'm going to turn directly to Dr. Dan Challenger, who is uh, uh, going to give his six minute address. Thank you, Marie Claire, and thank you, Michelle, for the uh, kind introduction. And like others, it's great to see this book um, published eventually. I think it's a fantastic volume. So, congratulations to, to all involved. Um, I'm going to try and answer the questions that are posed to the, the panelists in this session. And out of necessity, I'm going to be brief. I just want to reflect firstly on the, the sort of last 50 years of CITES. And if you look at the literature and the research that's been done, CITES can claim some success in species conservation terms. It's demonstrably solved the problem for which it was designed. And there are some nice examples of that. Various crocodilian species, the vicunia in South America, and the southern white rhino in South Africa. And this success is reflected through um, the conservation status of these species improving. But critically, the interventions that were implemented here went beyond strict implementation of the treaty. And they included the engagement of local communities and other actors in wildlife management and management of those species. Conversely, there are a range of reasons why CITES hasn't been um, so successful. Um, parties haven't implemented adequate legislation, a lack of resources for law enforcement, corruption, political will, and so on. And CITES is arguably also failing in some areas because it disregards the economic reality of international wildlife trade. And we touch on this in chapter nine of the book where we do a case study on pangolins in Asia. And so to the questions, uh, for this session. So what are some of the risks of failing to consider complexity, things like consumer demand, livelihoods and market dynamics and decision making? Well, for me, there are two main risks. Um, the first one is that without considering such factors, the CITES parties are likely to be making decisions which are highly uncertain when it comes to the actual impact of the trade measures and outcomes, both on species and on people. And in, in my opinion, much more could be done before COP meetings to look in detail at the proposed trade measures and their expected impacts on, on people and species. Um, thinking about the real world, the tangible impact. And as a nice example, at, at COP17 in 2016, 11 proposals were adopted in the final 32 minutes of one day without any discussion at all. And I think we can do much better when it comes to informed evidence-based decision-making there. The, the second risk, I think, is that um, 
CITES trade measures could do more harm than good for species. And this is something that isn't recognized enough, in my opinion, within the convention. Um, we have the precautionary principle in CITES, but it's not unidirectional uh, and more restrictions on trade are not necessarily the most, um, uh, the most precautionary policy option. Um, you know, and things like putting a species in Appendix 1, this could actually lead to uh, an opportunity for organized crime groups and in theory could accelerate the extraction and, uh, and, and trade in some species. And if you look at the black rhino in the 1970s, once the species went into Appendix 1, the species went locally extinct in 17 or 18 different range days as a result. So what can we do to create proficient systems of sustainable management uh, for use and trade of species? Well, I think we need to understand the social ecological systems in which the harvest use and trade of wildlife takes place along supply chains much better and situate CITES within broader institutional arrangements. So what are the key features of the social ecological systems that mean that species require inclusion in Appendix 1? or two. So this means understanding what's happening to species populations, but also the relevant actors and what are their incentives for the use and trade in wildlife and conservation of species or not. We also need to understand the governance systems, including institutions, and what are the rights and rules that apply to different actors along supply chains and how might changes to these rights and rules allow for greater compliance by actors and ultimately greater compliance by countries. And, and there's a whole range of uh, mechanisms that could be used to to get input from these relevant actors it could be public consultations it could be consultative governance processes and then yeah i think we need to situate cites trade measures within these broader institutional arrangements and and this isn't how cites currently works you know the actors that are involved the laws that apply how different actors might respond these are things that may or may not be considered in current decision making within cites and so how might we reform CITES to make it more effective? Um, well, I think in terms of specific reforms, we can encourage parties to research and understand the social ecological systems in which harvest use and trade takes place at different scales before submitting proposals to amend the appendices. Some of this takes place already. Different NGOs and, and states gather to discuss the science involved behind proposals. And we could broaden the scope of such meetings and workshops to include a, a better understanding of these systems. And we can encourage parties to include relevant information in proposals to amend the appendices. And a nice uh, example of this is uh, amending Annex 6 to ResComp 9.24, ReFCOP 17, to encourage parties to include both insights from the social sciences, but also economics as well. Uh, and this could provide a unique insight into the likely impact of, of trade measures and whether they're likely to contribute to improving the status of species or not. And, uh, you know, for example, economic modelling regarding um, legalising trade in rhino horn. There'd be a need to develop guidance on this to support the parties. But I think, you know, if we went down this path and um, included much broader range of insights um, to inform our decision making, psyches could go on to be much more effective over the next 50 years. So uh, I think I'm at time. So, yeah. Perfect time. Thank, Thank you so, you. so much, Dr. Challender. Uh, Dan, it really is appreciated. I'm going to turn directly to Stephen Johnson, who is joining us as well with a beautiful background. I, I decided to uh, theme the background uh, according to the chapter, so I'll, I'll let you take a guess um, which of the which of the three I work on, frankincense, uh, pangolins, or uh, or hammerhead sharks. <laughs> um, yeah, th thank you. Uh, I, I quite like the, the, the previous answers. Um, uh, so I, I think you'll hear um, a lot of my comments um, echoed in that as well. Uh, so first off, I think the, the bottom line is um, that if we, when, whenever we're considering um, a, a conservation challenge, we have to first understand what are all the factors that go into that and what are what is the desired um, the desired outcome that we want to see. And from there, pick the tool that is most likely to achieve that desired outcome. And I, I think the risk of not acknowledging the complexity that exists in uh, many wild harvested species and, and those supply chains is that we are not going to pick the, the correct tool, uh, tool for it. Now, CITES is very clearly a, a powerful tool um, to regulate wildlife trade, but it is like all tools, uh, it works in a certain way. It is designed uh, with particular mechanisms and is based on specific assumptions. And these may be generally true, but there will be cases 
that where it doesn't fit well. And I think we should be cautious about uh, applying it too broadly and uh, applying it to, to situations where it's not going, it's not likely to ultimately result in a, a positive outcome uh, for the species involved and the communities that depend on them. So a couple of the key considerations here are that it relies on the regulatory infrastructure of exporting states and range states and has a fairly um, a fairly uh, simple sort of a relationship between conservation and trade and conservation and livelihoods. That is, um, trade is increasing, um, high levels of trade are bad for species. Um, so if we can regulate that and, and control trade and bring that down, then that's going to likely to have a positive um, outcome. Now, as I mentioned, I come at this from the perspective of working on frankincense, which is a tree resin harvested from Boswellia trees and um, it exists in a variety of, of different states, but the, the biggest exporting states, um, three big, biggest exporting states are uh, Sudan, Somalia, and Ethiopia. And Sudan and Somalia are the largest in terms of both volume and value. Um, and so I, I think um, it, it's a, a fair statement to say that, that um, th there are states that deal with a number of challenges and have relatively limited resources to address, uh, address all of those challenges. Um, it's also complicated by the fact that um, these trees are very widely dispersed in the landscape and they grow in very remote areas, which makes it difficult to accurately assess uh, the sustainability of harvesting. And that's a problem because in, in this case, it needs to be, uh, sustainability needs to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the the, you need a living frankincense tree in order to continue to get resin. So there is uh, a, a built-in incentive to, to try to keep the trees alive. It doesn't always translate into good practices and sustainable management. There are plenty of cases where, where it hasn't, um, but th there is that inbuilt um, incentive. And so the, there isn't a straightforward relationship between the amount of resin being traded in, in most cases and the sustainability of that trade, um, which makes it a bit more complicated to, to assess. You could have five tons of resin that is very poorly managed, uh, that is extracted for very poorly managed trees. That would obviously be um, a, an undesirable situation. You could also have 50 tons of resin that uh, comes from sustainably managed trees and, and would be um, quite positive for, for um, the conservation and for um, the livelihoods of the communities that are harvesting it. So um, in that case, it's it's difficult to say, well, just because this level of, of material is being moved, that indicates an issue. So um, the practices are ultimately, the management practices are ultimately driven by the incentives that exist in the communities and particularly the rural remote communities uh, that are actually harvesting the material. And those incentives are, of course, um, created through a variety of, of factors around land tenure and cultural practices and levels of traditional knowledge and incentives in the value chain and all that. Um, but the often the issue is not that trade is is present, but the issue, but how uh, traders and um, and uh, companies involved in the supply chain interact with those communities and how and what kind of incentives they push. Uh, Trying to assess sustainability as a whole across single country or, or even single region um, is a bit problematic because, again, you get a lot of variation and you, you end up either glossing over issues that exist or um, or, or um, penalizing producers that and communities that are actually doing things right. Um, but by the same token, do, uh, trying to assess on a case by case basis is, of course, very difficult. Um, with yeah, you know, using just the infrastructure that um, that uh, exporting states like Somalia uh, have available to use, and the negative consequences of that are, are quite significant because it's also an absolutely critical livelihood um, for tens or hundreds of thousands of people in these communities, um, and is a, a, an important uh, source of income that that uh, is sort of resilient against climate change, whereas the other major sources like livestock are not. Um, so. Whenever we're designing an intervention, we want to try to protect the positive, uh, the positive value of the trade in terms of income to communities and incentives to protect the species, while still targeting the, the negative incentives. And I think some solutions around there um, could involve uh, looking at importing state legislation and regulation. Um, there's some very interesting uh, regulations uh, relevant to frankincense in the moment going on, uh, for instance, in the EU, the EU Due Diligence Act. There's also um, uh, legislation that is relevant in the United States, like the, uh, the U.S. Lacey Act. Um, none of those are perfect either, but they put pressure on the private sector companies that are driving a lot of the demand and that ultimately do have the resources to take more responsibility for their supply chains, um, which I, I think is a key seconds. factor there. 
yeah. council, you will conclude. Yeah. <laughs> do, you have, do, you have, do you have one last message? No, no, that's all right. Just, just um, I, I think that hit most of the main points. I don't want to go too far into overtime. Oh, thank you so, so much. Um, very, very helpful and truly laying out um, some of the most important and substantive issues in the book in particular um, across the entire chain for a species or a commodity, which is, which is deeply appreciated. And the suggestions that you have for ways to, um, uh, to improve or to um, uh, effectuate the, um, uh, the implementation is especially deeply grateful. Um, we do have a little bit of um, sad but good news which is that um, I have to thank all three of our speakers, but we will have a little bit of extra time because one of our um, final panel um, uh, is unable to join us. So we're gaining back a little bit of time in order to have more questions for all three of you, as well as um, the two speakers who are still with us from the, from the, the previous um, round table. So I will turn directly to um, the third um, round table now. And we are very, very grateful, of course, to be able to welcome um, two of the world's leading experts in this area. Um, and I, I am very, very pleased to, to, to be able to turn to looking at, in particular, um, national implementation um, of the CITES. And the three focus questions for those um, uh, experts are, what are some of the challenges for effective national implementation of CITES listings? What is the potential role of other agreements such as the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and Arts Paris Agreement or the Convention on Biological Diversity and its um, access and benefit sharing protocols among others for ensuring sustainable trade in wild species? And how can wild flora and fauna trade and law and policy benefit indigenous peoples and local communities. So we're coming back to some of the themes that Marcos and others have also highlighted, as well as the three experts on the recent panel. So I'm going to turn to Michelle again to introduce the speakers. And then I'm also going to say, um, Again, a very, very warm um, thanks to our three speakers, Professor Laura and Dr. Dan and um, uh, Stephen uh, for their uh, excellent remarks and their even more brilliant chapters in the book. Um, I would like to ask, if at all possible, could you answer um, by typing some of the questions that have already begun to pop up from your inspiring and, and certainly very engaging, intriguing remarks. Um, over, over across to you, Michelle. Thank you, Marie Claire, and thank you, Laura, Dan, and Stephen, for your deep insights and another fascinating discussion. We will now turn to our honored experts of our third and final roundtable discussion of the day on the national implementation of CITES. This discussion will involve two more outstanding global experts, Professor Carlos Antonio Marti Soraya Del Orso and Dr. Dennis Rulskert. Professor Carlos Soraya is an environmental lawyer for the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru, or the PUCP. He currently works as an international consultant. He is the co-author of the Code of the Environment and Natural Resources of Peru, as well as the General Law of the Environment, and is a postgraduate professor at the National Agrarian University La Molina in Lima, Peru, and the PUCP. And Dr. Dennis Roskart is faculty lead of Environment and Sustainability, Center for International Environment Studies at the Graduate Institute Geneva. He is associate researcher with Forest is Life, Terra Teaching and Research Center at the University of Liege, Belgium. He has worked for more than 25 years on four continents from a wide range of perspectives, local communities and indigenous people, development NGOs, transnational corporations, UNEP and academia. Welcome Carlos and Dennis. And over to you, Marie Claire. Absolutely. I would like to especially uh, invite Professor Carlos to give his six minutes, um, uh, which will lead to many, many more questions um, that he can then answer. Well, I'm delighted to join you all in this uh, launch of our book. This is a collective work that uh, summarizes for all our colleagues and uh, students all over the world on the tasks and uh, challenges of implementing international law and how to translate it into effective uh, public management. No? And um, to answer the question of challenges for effective national implementations of, of sightings, listings, and the potential of other agreements, I think first, there's a huge need to um, support the development of um, public administration as the preceding speaker just explained in the case of Somalia and other 
states where forest production or um, other biological resources come from, uh, questions of governance and questions of detailed government planning are uh, at the heart of the problem of improving compliance with the law. Next month, I will be teaching a course for 25 regional governors of fauna or wildlife in the in, in Peru. No? These are the regional administrators at provincial level <clears throat> from 25 different offices. And I will be telling them the experience of this uh, meeting and what we have learned over the years. No? The need for training, the need for planning, the need for enforcement, the need for monitoring and for feedback of the implementation of our legislation. And I think that is precisely the opportunity to link these issues with sustainable development goals that provide us with goals to be achieved in a number of areas, and particularly in the case of um, biological diversity, there's a number of goals that can be shared with these regional and local level administrators. Many of the work that we develop in international law and in these agreements needs to be leveled down to these authorities. And that doesn't mean translating, but rather uh, the divulging the information, sharing the ideas, the uh, thoughts, and the proposals that are being implemented. For instance, management plans, licenses, uh, monitoring with uh, electronic systems and so on, and improvements that need to be considered and shared with uh, these administrators. One of the problems of government is it, that it tends to work uh, alone, tends to work by itself. And what we need to strengthen is collaboration among entities, and that collaboration among entities can lead to planning, to assessing the implementation of the law, and to uh, design more accurate uh, action plans at the local and regional level. So I think we are at a very important opportunity to translate international environmental law into policy actions and I think provide a cover, provide a shed to uh, work in that, in that direction. Another uh, thing I want to mention is in regards to the answer uh, to the question on, on regards to indigenous peoples. I think uh, there's a plethora of examples of management by indigenous peoples in forested and in uh, aquatic ecosystems. And the problem is that we don't need how to, we don't know how to reach them. We don't know how to make contact between the uh, resource management on the ground and our programs and opportunities for, let's say, blue economy, for uh, land degradation recovery, and so on. And I think to, we need to renew the way we work with indigenous peoples. We are usually mediated. Uh, in these uh, initiatives through government offices, but we lack a lot of experience from um, other civil society organizations present on the ground, like NGOs, university, a uh, plethora of academic organizations. And I think that if uh, we go, go, go this way, we might reach the small uh, Janisha uh, who is uh, growing trees in his uh, land plot in the Sachopen community in Oxapampa, despite the fact that he's not registered on the government uh, plantations or he's not receiving benefits and so on. So uh, the experience of COVID uh, with uh, the terrible health uh, emergency that it meant, what it showed to us is that people on the ground need to uh, be contacted through our government administrators in order to facilitate implementation. Um, approaching the end of the uh, time, 
I think we'll be sharing more uh, in other answers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Soria, for these insightful words and for being perfectly on time, which shows uh, an extremely high level of legal skill. I'm going to turn straight to Dr. Denise Ruichert, who has been um, truly a remarkable contributor to this volume at all stages. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Marie Claire. Yes, um, yeah, I will, I'm very happy to, to be here. And uh, the three questions you ask are particularly relevant. I'm so happy to participate. Uh, let's go straight. Uh, if you talk about the, the challenge of implementation, you know, at national level, you know, I took the issue as I follow the oral test. Uh, technically, uh, you have uh, GL, you have five, then basically it looks perfect below, but the implementation is nearly impossible. One orotant out of 200 were basically a cough, and then the traders were uh, a cough, and, and, and it was even only a middleman. Why? There are two main problems we face. First is a prosecution on behalf of orotans. It's not well understood at local level in Indonesia. And why? Because they tend then to perceive that orotans could have equal rights to local people. And they don't think so because they tend to think that orotans at the end is just a pest. And how is it possible that we put people in jail for that? Second problem we face is this, uh, Building a legal case is quite difficult because first, of lack of information of who was beyond the culprit, and second, lack of support of the judge and the overall judicial systems. Basically, you have two very clear problems that are basically there along the way. Then what can we do? First, we need to understand what happens. In this case of the road tanks, in fact, the issue is a more a byproduct of our habitat loss. People don't go to trade rodents, but they are losing their lands because of deforestation. And therefore, our rodents come and go to their crop. And the people more take the small infants and start to trade them to get some incomes. Therefore, if you know this technical issue, we need to go then to the second question first, is what the other conventions can do to prevent that. And that's where we have a huge potential. If we understand these problems of trade as a byproduct of habitat loss, we can see that the other conventions, CBD, UNFCC, CMS, they are really focusing their habitat. Therefore, uh, not the cement, sorry, the, the natural heritage site. They really focus on the habitat. Therefore, they need to go together. And there's a big work to do that cities work, I think, together with, with the other conventions on that. One of the issues, it really happens in Indonesia, it is really relevant in our case, is that is the one on climate change. Why? Because on the climate change, it's possible again, to address a specific issue, which is the greenhouse gases emission. In that case, people on the orotant habitat knew exactly what was the amount of greenhouse gases. And instead of focusing on the orotant protections and trade, they focus on the greenhouse gases that are inside the whole territory and start to protect the territory for that against a whole palm firm. And in that case, in 2015, they did a, a huge uh, campaign and with the backup of the government, they achieved to really put in trial and to stop all palm ex extension uh, from a specific orotan habitat, just because they could demonstrate the, the, the contribution to climate change. Therefore, they stand from one issue, which is, biodiversity to one an issue that becomes climate because of the problem of the territory, uh, the ter territorial conventions is that they address a territory, but is not very clear what means biodiversity, whatever. But when it's talking about 
climate is greenhouse gases, it's very clear what it is, the amount of greenhouse gases. Therefore, it was easier. Then what can we do now to change the dynamic and to have the support of local people? As I say in the past, that the problem is that local people would think that it's a pest. Therefore, we need to change the issue also with the local people in their narrative. Local people are not necessarily against the animal or try to uh, be uh, bad people, trying to get the best. In fact, local people are quite uh, uh, in balance normally with their environment. They just want to protect their forest and to have benefit from it. And therefore, we need really to get them more on our board. And it becomes a very technical and a bit problematic issue about, for example, the rotents. Rotents are listed critically endangered in IUCN. And therefore, we have to protect them at all cost. In reality, rotents are still like 15,000 in, uh, in Sumatra and more than, more than 40,000 in, 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 uh, in, in, in Borneo. Therefore, the issue of rotents, if you take from the local perspective, can be still a manageable story, only, of course, if you protect their, 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 their uh, territory. Then to bring back now local people to protect Orotan is more about protecting basically their, their, uh, their, their, their territory. And if you achieve to protect the territory, in fact, the Orotans themselves should not be listed in this critically area. A critically uh, listed uh, piece of the this red red uh, list of the IUCN, and in that case they could even think to well let's talk about even trade them. Of course, it's not the case because we are losing the habitat. But it has to really think a bit like that out of the box because of if we don't think and change the narrative, we will always consider the local people against their own plants and animals. And the second thing, we also need to- The second and a little bit, point. Sorry, when the, the, the little perspective. We really need to take the perspective of the rotants that needs territory and, um, and, and also the perspective of the local people, but I, I say so. That's okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much as well, Dr. Lucien. <clears throat> You are uh, truly pointing out a crucial issue, especially for the sustainable development impacts and value of the CITES. And I think that everyone here would agree that that local participation and community engagement is um, where more scholarship needs to focus in the future. Now I'm going to ask if Michelle could bring everyone back from the panel because we have, through the extraordinary discipline of all speakers, been able to gain back the time we need to have a proper discussion. And we have some absolutely brilliant um, questions that have been raised in the chat that I would be very, very happy to set before you. So I'm going to start first with um, uh, one of the, the questions that I have been uh, seeing on the chat that I think um, we have promised to address in, in this discussion. But then I'm going to turn to Michelle as moderator to pull forward some of the other most relevant um, uh, questions. The one that I'm going to start with is um, uh, William Nayarenda, um, who has asked, um, um, why is it that the laws enacted seem to favor the superpowers, unlike the developing countries. I say so because very rare occasions can you find, say, an animal bird native to a place, say Costa Rica in Africa, but you can find a number of animals or birds native to developing countries, I mean Africa, in zoos, or indeed, um, I believe the person means um, uh, um, kept by um, wealthy people. What can be done to balance the equation? So I wonder if um, uh, anyone here would like to start with that question, and then I'm going to turn to Michelle, James, and the others to give us a few more. Who would be most comfortable starting with a brief explanation of the colonial dynamics that we have been debating and dealing with for, for since CITES was created and before? 
I think we cannot provide a, a direct answer on, on how to solve that problem. But what we can say is uh, walk on the path that uh, John Scanlon um, showed us. There are limitations on CITES. There is a need to integrate international agreements. My own chapter in the book uh, explains the need for integration with the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Convention on uh, Desertification. And I think Dan just uh, hit the nail when he said, uh, we, we don't need to look at species, we need to look at the territory or the landscape. Uh, so when we look at the uh, at a broader scale, then we look at the and at the interactions between the market, the community, and um, the results of our um, legislation and whether it's contributing or, or not. In my own chapter, also, I was dealing with one issue that is timber for uh, the world market. No, the the that's the case of mahogany. Well, in that case, it's. Uh, it's embedded in the question of, of, of this person that we basically supply in a market. Yes, that's how we got into it. And that's uh, what the world system, world economic system allowed to uh, start uh, uh, at the beginning. But we have a much broader picture now, uh, climate change and so on. So I will let my um, colleagues jump in. But I think... Uh, we started to answer in that way through landscape management and a much broader approach on the integration of international agreements. Thank you. Absolutely. And I will say um, to underline the point that you have made, it is through the um, contributions, the serious scholarship and contributions of um, uh, contributors such as yourself to volumes like this with Cambridge University Press that even academics can start to tear apart some of those um, uh, previous relationships and, 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 and build new ones that take into account knowledge all over the world and in all regions um, where leaders can be found um, rather than just one or two countries that like to put species in, in their zoos. So I will turn now to the three other participants and I'd like you to consider both this perennial question that is so central to the debate, um, which sustainable development itself as a concept is meant to bridge between um, environment and the concerns of especially um, the least developed countries. And also the second question that has been flagged in the chat from um, Abu Bakar Sidike, who has asked what pertinent shift is needed to effectively realize the obligations of CITES in an extremely natural resource hungry developing economy. And so I think, I think you can combine your answers to that question with your thoughts on the previous one and on Professor Soria's very, very insightful remarks. Andrew, I'm going to turn to you first as my co-chair, because I'm assuming that you can set the context for Marcos and Dan, and, and also, of course, Professor Laura. Thanks very much, um, Marie-Claire. Uh, no, I, I really just wanted, in, the, in relation to the first question, just to uh, add a little historical um, dimension, which you won't be surprised about, Marie-Claire. In terms of progress, sometimes, you know, and Yvonne referred to the 50-year history since CITES has um, but if you actually take another 70 year step back in time to the two earliest attempts to establish what became CITES, which was the London Conference uh, for the, establishing the Convention for the Preservation of Wild Animals, Birds and Fish in Africa, which occurred in 1900, and then subsequently another conference in London in 1933, over time, the first attempt to establish what is a, the present day site is only looked at the fauna. And it took 33 years before the international community recognized that fauna without the flora didn't make a lot of sense. So in that sense, the, there has already been quite considerable progress. In addition, I want to just give two examples that some of you may know of uh, and others perhaps not. Anyone who's been to a dentist will probably have heard of gutta percha which is used particularly in root canals. Now, gutta percha comes from a tree that occurs particularly in Malaysia and in the Philippines. Now that tree long before its use in dentistry was well known, was actually exploited almost to the point of extinction to provide the surrounding for the submarine cables that linked Europe and North America in the 1890s. 
when telecommunications was taking off. So one example where there was no convention and where we almost led to the complete extinction of that species. Another one in a similar period in the late 1890s, women in fashionable parts of London and Paris relied very much on a supply of ostrich feathers from Betuana land, what is present day Botswana. That has also been forgotten in the mists of time. So I think sometimes when we look at our timeframes, we need to extend those timeframes a little bit and enrich them with some of the historical detail. So it's not just the expanding the spatial scales, which Dan and, and Stephen alluded to very cogently in their presentations, but I think it's also the historical dimension that will enrich our understanding of the threats that some of these species are facing. That was just the one comment that I wanted to add, Marie Claire. There was no possible way that a question about history was not going to be nippled on by Andrew. All right, I'm going to turn straight to Marcus, then Laura, and then Dan, who has also been incredibly helpful in answering questions in the chat with some deep and substantive insights. Marcos. Oh, Marcos. Marcos, who is on mute. Yes, yes, I saw it. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to address the issue of a possible bias in CITES. And I, I think this is very important because I have heard that when I was with CITES, uh, many developing countries did come to me and address this. Uh, that there's literature on this, uh, and it's a very important point. And I think we'd be remiss to say that such bias does not exist, but such bias exists throughout all of the conventions. It's power politics. It's in the negotiations. Uh, least developed country will have two or three negotiators, whereas a uh, uh, high income country will have a negotiator for each agenda item. It's impossible to be able to deal with the whole things and to negotiate effectively. However, this has been improving uh, over the years. And if you look at conventions that are negotiated much later, say the, the uh, Nagoya Protocol on Excess and Benefit Sharing, developing countries had a much stronger voice as did indigenous groups in the negotiations of those treaties than they did in CITES, which is you know, an ancient treaty. Uh, it, venerable, we, say, we say venerable. That's right, that's right. So, so things are improving. And I, I think GRULAC as a group negotiates very well, primarily because most countries are middle income countries and not least developing countries that can afford to bring large delegations and have a good scientific basis in commerce. So I, this is a very difficult question. Uh, you have, I, I think we'd be remiss to not admit that bias in a certain form of neocolonialism still exists within the multilateral world, but it's interesting to see and try to understand how this is being addressed and being lessened over time. Thank you, Marie Claire. Absolutely, Marcos, and one conjures up images of a, a, a zoo in, um, in a country um, that doesn't have them, showing um, what we consider to be common birds like a robin or, um, uh, or indeed a cockroach. Um, so, um, so, so, so imagining a country that doesn't have cockroaches. Um, I'd like to also ask as Laura and, and Dan uh, give their answers, if they could also consider Winsome Ke Somme's um, uh, question about what are the achievements, difficulties, and lessons learned in implementing the biodiversity related conventions that CITES is, is, is part of a community with. Um, what implementation strategy can CITES develop for African states that are incredibly vulnerable for climate change? So I'm adding natural resources and climate change um, and, and, and collaboration with other treaties to the existing question about the development divide. <laughs> and I know you can handle it. Uh, Professor Garcia, Elizondo Garcia. Thank you. Um, yes, I also wanted to address the second question about the pertinent shift that is needed to effectively, effectively realize CITES. I think that it's important to remember that, as, as we said before, CITES is a trade convention. It's trying to re regulate trade, but it's not going to separate, separate uh, itself from the economic part. Of, of the matter. So I think it's important to try to play with that if, it, if you must, uh, if, you, if I can say it that way, and try to uh, 
use the part that is pre precisely economic development to try to work with it, but you cannot ban uh, economic matters from it. You cannot, for instance, tell uh, a, a local community, no, you cannot um, <clears throat> trade uh, a species, a determined species, I mean, could be hammerhead sharks or, or others. So you have to try to play with that. That's why my suggestion that we could try uh, in some cases to change the nature of the commodity, make it something economical, economic still, uh, because you have to make a living. We have to take into consideration that people and communities still need to develop their, their social uh, economic conditions. So we have to take that into account. So we cannot really, in my view, separate the part of economics, uh, of the economic nature of, of commodities. So I think it's important to try to make the best of it and try to involve the people as, as much as we can. And I think that's important if we are trying, if we're talking about climate change and uh, the nature of development, we need to take every variable into account. And we need to, uh, as I said before, I think it's very important to have the local people uh, inputs and try to work with them because a banning, for, for instance, banning the, the, the trade of, of uh, determined species is not going to work. It just only, it's only going to try to make a, uh, a, to, uh, a black market maybe or a different conditions for trade. So we try to, we have to try to regulate as much as we can, but always taking into consideration the three variables of social, environmental, and uh, economic sustainability. And I think that's very, uh, uh, it cannot be separated also for climate change, from climate change, because we have to, to, to have these, um, I think it's key to, to take into consideration the part of uh, these people and these uh, countries trying to, to, to precisely reach uh, a sustainable development. And I, I won't take any more of, of your time. I think it's exactly the points that I think the book especially holds core to the entire publication. Mm -hmm. And if this is truly what Cambridge University Press, you know, says to us, which is, you know, the authority in the field now, then then I think it's very important that it, it does so. You know, it's 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 not just one or two voices here. Uh, Dan, over to you. Yeah, thanks, um, Marika. I'm going to try and answer um, the first question and then the last question as well, to some extent, in terms of the overlap of uh, of MEAs and the trade dynamics that were described in the first question, um, for me, arguably relate to how those laws were implemented and informed in the first place. Um, so in Cameroon, for instance, you know, the legislation that currently applies came in, in the 1990s, heavily influenced by the World Bank, arguably an element of US hegemony going on there in terms of what laws countries should impose to regulate wildlife use and trade. But there has been some progress to address some of this since. And if you look at the IPBES assessment on the sustainable use of wild species and the outcomes of the IUCN uh, Protected Areas Congress in Kigali last year, explicitly recognized both of those that um, context specific interventions are what work to conserve species and local communities and indigenous people should be empowered to conserve indigenous species and you know this legitimacy aspect of um, applicable rights and rules is really key because where there isn't social legitimacy of those rights and rules you're not going to get compliance and arguably what's needed in many places is a reconfiguration of the rights and rules that apply to different actors along supply chains um, and if you can get participatory, participatory processes ongoing, consultative governance processes ongoing, have the elements of procedural justice within those processes, so the rights from, that local people have are respected and their voices are heard, then you can design in compliance to the regulation systems. And if we can start to do that at scale, then we can start to contribute to um, successful um, case studies within CITES, but also successful case studies um, within other MEAs as well. If you achieve success in CITES, then you're going to be contributing to some of the goals of the CBD and some of the goals in the CMS. And there are nice examples of this working as well. The Cyber Antelope and the cross work between um, CITES and CMS is one such example. Excellent. Well, thank you so, so much. And with that, I would like to, like to thank all of our um, uh, experts who, number one, have written brilliant chapters in the book that I think everybody on our list of um, uh, 700 who have registered for this event and will be watching it afterward or will are, are with us today is 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 looking to find or buy 
And then also, I would like to thank you for highlighting your uh, expertise and your arguments um, uh, in this session today. I understand that we have been joined by our closing keynote speaker, and she is with us online. So without further ado, I will turn directly to uh, Dr. Wardell to introduce her. This is a closing keynote from the Chief Executive Officer of the Center for International Forest Research and World Agroforestry, and she's also the Director General of World Agroforestry, Dr. Eliane ubali -Joru. Secretary General Yvonne Higuero and distinguished panelists, it's a privilege to deliver the closing keynote at this virtual book launch. The book we are celebrating today, CITES as a Tool for Sustainable Development, published by Cambridge University Press, marks a departure from a traditional focus on terrestrial vertebrates. In fact, it expands to encompass various tree and aquatic vertebrate species. This is a significant contribution to the ongoing discussions about wildlife conservation and addressing the present biodiversity crisis. As Yvonne told delegates at the 18th Conference of Parties, humanity needs to respond to the growing extinction crisis by transforming the way we manage the world's wild animals and plants. Business as usual is no longer an option. She's right. We do need to respond and we are responding. Halting and reversing biodiversity loss is a moral imperative and it's also essential for our own human survival. An estimated 75% of the Earth's land surface has been significantly altered and 60%, 66% of the oceans are exhibiting signs of cumulative human impacts. Habitat degradation associated with large-scale land use changes is a key driver of biodiversity and species loss. But the overexploitation of wildlife, including the illegal wildlife and plant trades and related biosecurity risks, are key threats to the current biodiversity crisis. An IPBES report concluded that human action threatens more species with global extinction than ever before. An average of around 25% of species in assessed animal and plant groups are threatened suggesting that around 1 million species already face extinction. Many within decades, unless action is taken to reduce the intensity of drivers of biodiversity loss. This warning served as a wake-up call and highlighted CITES' critical role in continuing to protect timber, fish, and wildlife from overexploitation. Although I focus on trade in tropical timber species, the volume includes a rich and diverse collection of chapters, as we have heard from our panelists today. They explore many other cases relating to the overexploitation of fisheries. This includes the scalloped hammerhead shark, trophy hunting of markor and the protection of the Sumatran orangutan, as well as several cross-cutting themes, such as understanding markets to conserve CITES-related listed species, trade in zoonic diseases, and CITES as a tool for monitoring and adaptive management. The main characteristic of CITES is the listing of species which are at risk from trade in one of the three appendices. By February 2023, there were 704 animals and 395 plants in Appendix 1, which are endangered, that can only be traded in exceptional circumstances and require both import and export permits. In Appendix 2, there are more than 5,000 animals and almost 35,000 plants, representing species which can be traded subject to regulation often based on agreed annual quotas and the provision of expert export permits. Appendices 3 is a unilateral listing for which trade controls are relatively minimal and includes 372 animals and 134 plants. Hundreds of species are added to the CITES appendices, particularly appendices 2, every three years after each COP. In 1975, when CITES came into force, only 18 tree species were listed under the convention and therefore subject to international trade controls. Proposals to list commercially traded timber species in the stricter Appendices 2 as opposed to Appendices 3 often met resistance, particularly for range states. There was a common misconception that listing a species was equivalent to a trade ban. 
Source countries were therefore concerned that it would result in prohibited or restricted use and consumption. In 2007, at COP14, this resistance from range states, where a particular species occurs, manifested itself in the defeat of all proposals to list timber species, which had been forward, put forward by the EU. Six years later, in March 2013, the Bangkok CITES COP16 saw quite a different outcome. More than 350 tree species were listed, around 200 of which are used and traded for timber. All the proposals that were put forward were unanimously accepted. Madagascar, Belize, Thailand, and Vietnam proposed listing of nearly 300 ebonies and rosewoods in Appendices 2. Kenya proposed listing East African sandalwood populations also in Appendices 2, which was also accepted. This positive shift in attitude coincided with the launch of a joint collaborative program under CITES and the International Tropical Timber Organization. The goal was to support a capacity building program to strengthen implementation of CITES for timber species. It's worth noting that the number of listed timber species has continued to expand. A CITES tree species program initiated in 2017 aims to provide direct financial assistance to parties in taking conservation and management measures to ensure that their trade in timber, bark, resins, and other products from CITES listed species is sustainable, legal, and traceable. Since COP16, considerable progress has been made in tackling international trade and tropical tree species, but more needs to be done. And at C4 ICRAF, we are keen to support this work. Although CITES, as the book illustrates, has made significant contributions to improving the regulation of the international timber and wildlife trade, significant gaps still remain. Many species, such as the Chihuahuaco in Peru, where it is widely harvested to supply the international trade in Parquet, are not listed. The domestic lit trade in listed species is not addressed by the convention. Although this has been addressed in resolutions that have had some impact for certain species, notably with respect to the trade in ivory and pangolins. In CITES, and CITES does not accurately monitor supply, particularly where trade is illegal, and it does little to consider the complex nature of demand or contend with changing market dynamics. One problem applicable to all international tra trade in wildlife species is that a stamp on an official document is not sufficient to guarantee actual legality in many countries. This is a key issue in the context of laws like the U.S. Lacey Act and the recent EU deforestation regulation, where the buyer or supplier is responsible for the legality of their goods, regardless of their intentions. But we need more synergies to prevent creating new loopholes in regulating international trade. I think this book and the conversations around it are an excellent step forward. I wish Yvonne and her team at CITES Secretariat every future success in building on the significant achievements to date. At C4 ICRAF, we are particularly interested in exploring how to strengthen future collaborations with the CITES Secretariat. And lastly, I'd like to congratulate the editors, Professor Marie-Claire cordonnier seguer Dr. David Andrew Wardell and Dr. Alexandra Harrington, as well as contributing authors on an excellent new contribution to CITES and how best to address the biodiversity crisis. Thank you. Many thanks, especially um, both to Eliane, if you could convey them to her, and, and to you for being kind enough to still ensure that her messages were taken into account. I would like to also address live the questions that have come up in the Q&A about the recording because many of our colleagues are extremely interested in it. And what we will do is that we will, we will take a, a two-step two approach to, to the recording of the event. We will not only send it to everyone who has registered, 
um, so that you have the recording of the event if you wish to play parts of it, as some people have mentioned, to uh, your class or to um, other groups of your staff. We will also, however, ensure that an edited version of some of the main points that have been made by the experts and by our brilliant keynote speakers, including a video recording of Eliane herself delivering her speech, if she wishes to do so, um, is made available afterwards as a contribution um, to the debates on CITES and sustainable development. And those shorter versions then will be sent to all participants and also posted on the YouTube channel and on the CISGL website and given to C4 to share themselves as well as to the CITE Secretariat to share as they deem appropriate. So we hope that that will be um, uh, released um, uh, in good time after this event. And we expect to send the um, link to the recording um, of the event um, um, uh, pure um, without without changes um, very very soon after this event to everyone who has registered. Um, I hope that that answers the many questions which um, are demonstrating very very strong interest in 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 among the um, uh, um, uh, participants in the event. I'm now going to turn back to my co-chair, Dr. Andrew Wardell, and perhaps also Professor Cabrera, if he's able to be back on dine with us, to assist us by providing just a few concluding remarks based on the discussions today, which have truly been rich, insightful, and substantive. I'm not particularly surprised by that. Yes, final flash of book, because of course I've read your chapters and edited them in the book, and I knew very well the incredibly significant and um, helpful degree of expertise that we were being fortunate to bring around the table um, uh, for, this, for this special celebration um, of a book that was a long time coming and is really lovely to see. So I will um, turn over to uh, Dr. Wardell um, and, uh, and, and say warmest of thanks first, of course, to, um, uh, to our, our participants who have been stayed with us online despite running a little bit over time. Um, we expect to finish at about um, uh, 15 minutes past the hour rather than on the hour. And, um, uh, and, and also especially for bringing so many excellent questions, which many of you answered by typing into the chat, which we deeply appreciate. Uh, and then I will also, of course, thank my co-chairs, the authors and experts who have spoken. And I will leave it to Andrew to sh thank um, some really, really terrific people who are here with us online making the entire event possible. Andrew. Thanks very much, Marie Claire. As, as Marie Claire mentioned in her introductory remarks, I've been given this impossible task to try and pull together some very rich discussions and ideas that have come out in some of the discussions. Um, I hope I do justice to all of the speakers and obviously to Yvonne and uh, Eliane for their opening and closing plenaries. Uh, but please forgive me if I have not made a completely exhaustive account of all your different contributions. But I would like to try and summarize in terms of the following key points. I think we've recognized um, and, and echo some of the comments that were made by Yvonne that CITES, uh, I think, does justifiably uh, consider itself as one of the successful uh, multilateral environmental agreements. And part of that success has been attributed to the fact that it has some trade related teeth. Uh, when it needs to bite, it can bite, uh, which is not something which is characteristic of, of, of some other multilateral environmental agreements. It functions, however, in all countries where there is already a complex array of local, regional, national, and very often international administrative, civil, criminal, and environmental regulations which are already in place to implement conservation strategies. In addition, I think we recognize, and this was alluded to by some of the discussants, that the convention has faced growing pressures to address issues related to greater participation by local communities and indigenous people, but also issues related to habitat loss, emerging zoonotic diseases, and human wildlife conflict, let alone the whole issue of wildlife crime and international trade. In many cases, these are issues that the convention was not actually designed to regulate, and that needs to be recognized. It has nevertheless distinguished itself as a convention in terms of being an extremely complex, but very dynamic multilateral environmental agreement which has been, I think, over the last 50 years, successfully able to navigate, adjust, and adapt throughout its history, as the signatory parties to the convention have used different instruments to rise to new challenges in regulating international 
wild plant and animal trade. It's been able to do that through the adoption of a number of supportive measures. By July 2020, I haven't been able to, to uh, update this, more than 100 resolutions and 330 decisions had come into effect. The National Legislation Project has been assisting parties to adapt national laws and regulations once they have ratified the convention. We've seen the establishment and the functioning of the permanent committees, the budget and work program of the CITE Secretariat, rules for controlling trade mechanisms integral to implementation and compliance. And we heard several times about the uh, non-detriment uh, findings and the review of significant trade for species listed in Appendix 2, and texts which have established long-term compliance processes. And this doesn't even include the hundreds of proposed additions or changes that occur in terms of the listings to one of the three appendices which follow every COP every three years. In addition, I think several of the discussants have continued to raise the many challenges that implementation of CITES faces, not least of which are the national capacities to actually implement. And I know from my own experience working in several sub-Saharan African countries, particularly in the Congo Basin, the capacities of national management authorities, let alone national scientific authorities, are extremely weak. In some cases, limited to one person who has been through a master's degree at a university in Spain. <laughs> yep. those, challenge, those challenges are still there. Um, in addition, I think we've heard from several other speech, uh, speakers of some of the challenges in rising to the task of addressing the complexities of the value chains associated with the trade in some of these endangered uh, species. And I think at that point, I would like to stop. Uh, I hope I've done justice to most of the discussants. I'm sure I haven't covered every point. But um, in the interest of time, and in case Jorge would like to uh, add anything, or Marie-Claire, I will stop here. Thank you so much, Andrew, for your extremely helpful remarks, especially given um, the impossibility of summarizing what has been a very, very rich and insightful discussion, and what is indeed a, uh, let me see, several hundred page book. Um, Yes, I think 539 page volume. <laughs> Once you've passed 500 mark, it's a volume, not a book. So thank you very, very much, especially to, um, uh, to, to everyone who has contributed to this volume. I think we can well and truly with, with juice and um, water and anything else that fizzes or bubbles, um, uh, declare this book launched. I'd like to ask if our um, colleagues can put the entire group on, on, on the screen who is left to take a last survivor's photo with a screenshot. And, um, and, and what we would um, uh, like to also do, of course, especially while we're lining up that shot, is to say um, very, very warmest of thanks first, of course, um, to the authors and, and, and um, uh, the contributors to the book, but also to somebody without whom this entire volume would be completely impossible. I speak not of the Cambridge University Press colleagues, though of course they have my thanks, not of um, my co-editors, though of course it's been a delight to collaborate with them, but to Michelle who has turned on a dime and worked incredibly hard over more than three years to help bring this to fruition. I'm certain that without her, this would not have been possible. She'll never say it herself, so I'm going to say it. She's brilliant, she's humble, she's incredibly hardworking and competent, and she's written a PhD on this issue. So who wouldn't want to um, be directly engaged with her on some of these matters going forward? Um, and I think the Canadian delegation have been very intelligent to snap her up and put her onto their team um, already in several CITES meetings. But I think she would be best destined for the international world. So that is my pitch um, and my thanks to Michelle for all of her hard work. Um, I'd also like to thank some of the uh, young lawyers who have joined us and, and legal scholars, particularly James Magher, a GED candidate at the University of Victoria, and Cassie Lumsden, another JD candidate at the University of Victoria, and our rapporteurs, Alison Belinke, who is doing her JD at the University of Victoria, Samantha Anderson, who is not only doing a JD at the University of Victoria, but is the newest member of the CISDL working on a natural resources volume, which we have great hopes for, 
and uh, Sunny, Miss Wen Sun, who's an MPhil candidate here with me at the University of Cambridge. So I would like to especially thank that team who have done an absolutely stellar job um, with this event today. And I, I, I would truly like to thank them for, for their contributions. I can see that John has been able to rejoin us having rescued his children from being left at the curb in perfect timing for our um, uh, screenshot um, that will be conveyed with the event. So I think we could all actually just do a thumbs up and, and I, will, I will hold the book. Um, I might even have to um, uh, uh, unblur my background um, so that um, you can see the book without it fading away. There we go. Um, and, uh, and if you would like to, uh, to take our screenshot with our thumbs up and our book, um, there we are. Andrew is holding his. Um, CUP is sending, sending one to every author and also to Michelle as our assistant editor. Thank you so, so much. Three, two, one, smile. And then we're going to do another one, which is um, with two hands in the air, um, uh, looking sort of a little bit, oh my goodness, I can't believe we pulled this off after 12 years. <laughs> and, and don't look tired. All right. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, John, that was perfect. <laughs> the, the, the Spanish, seriously, everyone. Um, but well done. And thank you. And thanks to everyone for their incredible patience. Um, congratulations. With that, I will I will close the event. Thanks. Great work. Well done. Thank Many you thanks to everyone. Well, to you, John, and to everyone who made this possible. Yes. Big clap Thank you. for everyone. Thanks. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.